It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. the Premier. Parents, students, teachers and school boards have been raising concerns about the Premier's plan for cuts in our classrooms. Yesterday, the Premier made it clear they should also plan for chaos in September. The Premier accused teachers of being underworked and overpaid and then described the relationship with teachers and the government as being at a state of war. Does the Premier think this strengthens our education system? Questions to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what strengthens our education system, but even better strengthens our country, was the big win from our friend Jason Kenney. Yeah. 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 What, a, what a great ally to, to join the Anti-Carbon Alliance. Yeah. I'll tell you, he, he's going to be there shoulder to shoulder for everyone in the country. We see a blue, just a blue wave going across this and country from one. west to east, yeah. no matter if it's Blaine Higgs out in New Brunswick, if it's uh, uh, Jason Kenney, sorry, good one. J Jason Kenney, Scott Moe, Brian Palster, there's going to be five premiers. <laughs> five, five premiers, Mr. Speaker. That is dead against this carbon tax. Here, here. We're building Response. an anti-carbon tax alliance like this country has never seen. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, but that does not answer the question. There hasn't even been a single day of negotiations, and the Premier is already talking strike. He's declaring war and on the people who teach our students, and our students will pay the price. We're already seeing the results. In my community in Peel Region, 369 teachers with Order. the Peel District School Board learned yesterday that they will no longer have permanent positions heading into the new school year. If the Premier respects teachers and educators in our province here in Ontario, why is he firing so many of them? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry has to come to order. Premier to respond. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Again, this is this is process. It's been going on for years and years. It went on under the Liberals. You know how the system system works. The school boards are going to get their budget. They're going to be hiring back the teachers because not one single teacher will lose their job. Not one single teacher. We put seven hundred million dollars back into education, Mr. Speaker, making sure that our grade six math students are going to be able to be at the top tier of this country instead of the the bottom tier of this this country. We respect the teachers. The, respect, uh, the teachers do an incredible job, absolutely incredible job. We're going to support them. Mr. Speaker, the teachers' union went on strike under Bob Ray. They went under strike under Mike Harris. They went on strike under McGinty and went under uh, Kathleen Wynne as well. What stops Spons? them from striking again? We don't want a strike. We want the teachers back in the classrooms. They, what they're going to be doing is hurting the parents. They're going to be hurt. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And through you to the Premier, if you want to work with the teachers, maybe you should listen to the concerns that they're raising. Um, but even the Education Minister couldn't defend the Premier's comments yesterday, and it's clear that he's hoping for a fight, and we know what that means. Cuts and chaos in our classroom, Speaker, and our students will pay the price. It truly does not have to be this way. Will the Premier tone down the rhetoric and scrap his plan for larger classes, fewer courses, and his war with our educators? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga, come to order. Premier to reply. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Before the ink was dry when we won the election, the teachers' unions declared war on us. Yep. They told all yep. the teachers to save up three months of pay yep. because they're going to war. That's right. It was, it was a day after. They, they couldn't help themselves. We don't want to go to war. We want the teachers in the classrooms. We want the kids in the classrooms learning. That's what we want. We're going to do everything we can to negotiate a fair deal, a fair deal for the teachers, a fair deal that the parents and the students get back into the classroom. 
Mr. Speaker, we have a great system. We just want to make it better. We want to make sure there's accountability. We want to make sure there's transparency. Most importantly, we want our students to succeed. To succeed when they get out into the work world, they'll be able to go out there and find an incredible job because we have the economy Response. booming right now. We support our teachers, we support our students, and the parents as well. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Minister of Education. Yesterday, in response to the Premier's comments, the Minister emphasized, and I quote, the importance of making sure we have good faith conversations with our Labour partners and our education partners. Would the Minister describe the Premier's declaration of war against teachers as good faith conversation? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Right. Speaker. And I'm very pleased today to stand in front of you and share with everybody in this House, as well as everyone watching, that we are approaching our negotiations with the teacher unions, our labour partners and our education partners in good faith. We've actually invited them to come to the table as early as April 29th. We're ready to go because, again, teachers want to teach and we need to ensure that they have a great learning environment so students can learn because they want to be in the classroom, they want to be learning, and they want to be achieving. That is our number one focus. And I would suggest to you, Speaker, that everyone in this House should agree that our number one priority should be student achievement. The politics need to be left to the politicians, and yep. we need to leave the classrooms alone so that, again, teachers can teach and students can learn, Response. and that is what we're standing up for. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Minister of Education. I'd like to remind the Minister that her responsibility is to defend the students and staff and not the Premier. Students, parents and educators are watching this government with concern. They're already seeing the cuts. We mentioned the 369 layoff notices in Peel, but just yesterday we got news of 111 teaching jobs disappearing in Lambton, Kent, and 69 in Avon Maitland Board in the Minister's own riding. And today in Ottawa, the Board is reporting 300 more teaching positions at risk. Now, we see the Premier gearing up for a strike before a single day of negotiations have taken place. Does the minister believe the Premier picking a fight with teachers is good for our education system? And if not, what is she going to do about it? Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, I can tell you very clearly and distinctly that I will not cave in to the nonsense and the rhetoric that is coming from across in the member opposite the critic of education because it's absolutely ridiculous what she is suggesting. You know, she referenced uh, surplus notices that have been given out uh, around southwestern Ontario, and I find it interesting that she should reference one in my particular riding because if anyone went to Blackburn News and checked the source of that particular story, they would see that press release came from OSSTF. Oh. Again, it's shameful. It's shameful. Order. The forces behind the scenes wow. in, in terms of the there's no end to what they will do to cause chaos. It's the forces behind the scenes that are propping up this opposition party that that's that behind-the-scenes nonsense Response. that's causing the chaos. We are focused on student achievement. We're focused on making sure teachers have a great environment in the classroom where students can learn. Thank you. <laughs> Member for Ottawa Centre has to come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, well, let's talk rhetoric because if the if the government would come clean about what these cuts mean, then you wouldn't have to have OSSTF expl explaining what these cuts look like. And by the way, board after board is repeatedly contacting us, talking out publicly now. Good faith conversation with the people who teach our kids and make schools work is absolutely vital to our education system. The minister can't claim she's talking to teachers in good faith while the premier's doing more on educators. And she can't claim that no one is losing jobs as the layoff notices are flying out the door. This is not normal. Nope. This is a recipe Order. for cuts in the classroom right. and chaos in our schools. Will the minister stand Order. up for education, tell the premier to tone down the rhetoric and scrap the government's plan for larger classes, fewer courses and a war on education? That's right. 
The member for Markham Stouffville will come to order. The member for Mississauga Streetsville will come to order. The Minister of Education to reply. Thank you very much. Do you know the only rhetoric that people are hearing is being generated by the NDP party and their friends behind the scenes, and that needs to stop because what they're trying to do is deflect from the amazing things that we've announced in our budget and that we announced in our education plan. reality that we have a broken education system in this province. After 15 years of mismanagement, the school system is broken, and it's time we get it back on track. And we're not Thank going to cave in to rhetoric from the opposition party or their forces behind the scenes. We're going to stay focused. We're investing in education. As the Premier said, we're investing $700 million alone this year. And again, not one teacher will involuntarily lose their job. We're investing $1.6 billion dollars in attrition protection. That is a fact. I apologize to the member for Mississauga Streetsville. I should have called to order the member for Mississauga East Cooksville, as a matter of fact. But now we, we've got to start the clock again. There's another question to come. Next question. Member for Temiskaming, Cochrane. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Communities across Ontario were blindsided by the government's surprise decision to scrap 49 of the province's 59 local paramedic services. Michel Chrétien, Director of Emerging Services in Prescott Russell, expressed the views of many rural communities, and I quote, it really scares me where the rural communities will be less well served than urban communities. Why did the government blindside these professionals instead of working with them? Questions to the Premier. The Minister of Labour. Referred to the Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, uh, our government was elected to transform the health care system. Uh, we're uh, modernizing the emergency health services in Ontario by building a more integrated and efficient dispatch and communication service delivery system that will better meet the needs of Ontario communities. I've heard for years, if not over a decade, for the need for transformation to come about in the emergency medical system dispatch. I want to say to the member opposite that no Ontario paramedic will lose their job, just the opposite. We're actually empowering our great frontline paramedics to improve the already great <laughs> emergency care they provide in communities each and every day. Um, and our government has said all along that we're reinvesting uh, back office administrative efficiencies right into improving frontline care, where it's the patients first that we care about, and that's what we're focused on. Supplementary. People in rural Ontario have a right to be afraid because in a lot of parts of rural Ontario we don't even have 911 service. That's right. So, but even if you look, if you look in, in urban Ontario, in Hamilton, when only one or fewer ambulances were available for emergencies, it's known as a code zero. It happened 19 times in February alone. Oh, Paramedics say a plan to disband and amalgamate municipal ambulance services will be, and I quote, a kick in the teeth. Why did the government develop this scheme without talking to frontline providers first? Minister, reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, I take a bit of offence to the member opposite for the question, just saying that the, the government, and especially myself representing rural Ontario, don't know the needs of rural Ontario. That is absolutely not true. We do. And we've heard uh, from those communities. You know that the coming months. This isn't happening overnight. The coming months, we're going to continue to work directly with our municipal partners, our paramedic service providers, and others as we modernize emergency health services. We're going to upgrade technology used by ambulance communication services, better connecting ambulance and communication centers, dispatchers, and paramedics, introducing new models of care to ensure patients are treated at the most appropriate health care facilities, and modernizing that system by better integrating dispatch and service delivery. And, Mr. Speaker, I've already had uh, communication this morning from paramedics, former paramedics, that said the system was long overdue in changing and that the patients will receive better care, and that's what we're going to do on this side of government. 
Thank you. Stop the clock. We start the clock. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week's budget showed that we are taking a balanced approach to government. We are on a path to balance, while at the same time putting money back into people's pockets and making Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Just look at the action we've taken so far. Since taking office, we've sent a clear message that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. We cancelled the Liberals' cap-and-trade carbon tax, and we reduced WSIB premiums, allowing businesses to keep more of their money to reinvest and to create jobs. We've been hard at work making Ontario a competitive place to invest, grow a business, and create jobs. Could the Premier tell the House how our first budget builds upon this success? Questions to the Premier. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence. What an incredible champion. You know, some, I know a lot of people up in Eglinton Lawrence, and she's an absolute champ up in, up in the area there. Let me also take a, a moment to thank our incredible Minister of Economic Development, yeah. Job Creation and Trade. We've been, <laughs> we've been traveling around the province, Mr. Speaker, talking to small, medium, and large companies, and they're just over the top with our government. They know they have a government. It's a pro-job legislation government. That means it's pro-people, and when you have pro-people, you have pro-community, pro-Ontario. We are thriving right now. Our biggest problem out in the province, we've created the environment to create so many jobs, we don't have enough people to fill these incredible jobs. We're putting incentives out there for companies to thrive. And again, when companies thrive, the employees thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Premier for his response. It is exciting to see the renewed confidence the business community has in Ontario, because for far too long we've watched businesses leave our province and overtaxed and overburdened and take their jobs with them. But those days are over. Ontario's competitiveness is a top priority for this government. We know that restoring the province's fiscal health goes hand in hand with restoring its economic health. And this is particularly important in light of recent tax reforms in the United States. Now, more than ever, we must ensure that Ontario can truly be open for business and open for jobs. Could the Premier please inform the House what our government is doing in our budget to increase Ontario's competitiveness advantage? Premier to reply. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the great question. We promised we'd cut corporate income tax, and that is exactly what we're doing. We're actually delivering earlier on our commitment for that. The Ontario Job Creation Investment Incentive will reduce the tax burden on businesses. We create immediate, immediate investment into Ontario, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing, and I, and I have to, I have always said with the federal government, if they do something great, I'll compliment them. They worked with the province to accelerate the write offs in any capital investment in any company. What they're able to do is invest and write it off immediately. Compared to prior, you'd have to wait years over years over years to write it off. So they're investing back into, back into their companies. This incentive will provide $3.8 billion in Ontario tax relief for businesses over the next six, six years. It's estimated, it's estimated that Response. the incentive will create between 50 and 90,000 wow. net new jobs. That's on top of our other... 125,000 jobs that we created. We're creating the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, throughout the week, the Premier and his team have struggled to defend their plan to spend millions of public dollars making campaign stickers for Andrew Scheer. Millions more forcing every gas station in, in Ontario to sport one, and even millions more to collect a 
$10,000 fine from any businesses that refuse to pledge allegiance to Andrew Scheer. Speaker, now the Toronto Star reports government that side, the government is about to flood the airwaves with even more partisan ads. The Premier campaigns and sends the bill to the taxpayers. Speaker, how much are we going to pay for the Premier's massive ego trip with these stickers in the province of Ontario? The member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry, come to order. The member for Etobicoke Centre, come to order. Questions to the Premier. Minister of Energy. Of Energy and Northern Development, Mines and Aboriginal Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just, just member want to for say Essex, that come to order. Night, Alberta sent a clear message. Member for Essex, come to order. The member for Essex, come to order. The member for Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. Clock's ticking. Yeah, it is. Member for Waterloo come to order. Question is to the uh, is been referred to the Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night, Alberta spoke loud and clear, Mr. Speaker. They said NDP. They chose. They chose a premier who said right off the bat, Alberta is open for business. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I see an alignment here. Ending the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and New Brunswick, we stand shoulder to shoulder to get rid of this job-killing, regressive carbon tax. We're hearing from businesses across the province, Mr. Speaker, that the price, the sticker on every product is going to go up as a result of this job-killing, regressive carbon tax. We won't have anything to do with it, Mr. Speaker. We have a responsibility to let the people of Ontario know how much this the tax is costing, and we're going to put those stickers up Response. so they have an opportunity to be reminded of it every time they go to get gasoline That's at that right. shop. Supplementary, the member president. Speaker, it's clear that the Premier wants to campaign for the Prime Minister's job and stick the taxpayers of Ontario with the bill. Not only that, Speaker, he plans to hit anyone who doesn't go along come to with order. his plan with a $10,000 a day fine. Speaker, if the Premier wants to be a part of the federal campaign, he should register with Elections Canada as a third party today. <laughs> I can send the guidelines along to the Premier for his reference. Speaker, will he do that, or will he admit that these schemes are wrong and cancel them today? Good luck. <laughs> Member for Kitchener, Conestoga, come to order. Mem the Minister for Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, I can hear. Must come to order as well. Member for King Vaughan has to come to order. Start the clock. Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, what, what's sticking in the minds of the people who live in Essex? What's sticking in the minds of people from East Hamilton, Stony Creek? What's sticking in the minds of people in Timmins, Kiwaitnung, Mr. Speaker, Algoma, Manitoulin, is the cost of this job-killing regressive carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. Now, some of those members over there drive big pickup trucks. I know at least one does, Mr. Speaker, to get around their vast riding for safety, Mr. Speaker. To help folks out. This is going to make gas way more affordable, uh, unaffordable, Mr. Speaker. As those costs climb for the people of Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, we're taking a stand. We're fighting this job-killing regressive carbon tax, and every opportunity we are going to let the people of Ontario know where it hurts the most when they're uh, fueling up their automobiles, their buses, their business vehicles, Mr. Speaker. Response. That this is costing them and the people of Ontario too much, and we won't have anything to do with it. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. I am ecstatic to hear our government's announcement of the subway expansion project to get the GTHA moving again. With a total project cost of $28.5 billion, this is truly an amazing opportunity. An investment of this magnitude is Order. not only important to help get the Toronto area back on track, 
but it is important for so many others in the province of Ontario. This incredible plan will take years to build and will certainly provide a significant boost to the economy by creating many jobs as well as creating great opportunities to suppliers in many industries and sectors. Can the minister please explain the ways this project will help the province question. outside of the benefits to the future riders of the subway? Great question. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Sault Ste. Marie for a great question, and he truly is an amazing member for Northern Ontario. A strong voice. Speaker, as the uh, member uh, noted last week, we made a historic announcement in Etobicoke, $28.5 billion to build new subways in Toronto yeah. and the GTA. Mr. Speaker, this is the largest investment ever made in Canada in order to get shovels in the ground and to build the subways, and that's what we're going to do. We are going to build subways in Toronto and the GTA. The construction of these projects are going to create tens of thousands of jobs, well-paying jobs for middle-class people and for the hard-working people that want to get to work, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to sharing more of the economical benefits in my supplementary. Supplementary question. Thank you again to the minister. Mr. Speaker, in the words of my friend, the member from York Centre, I want to hear more about subway, subway, subways. While the GTHA anxiously awaits the building of all this infrastructure, I could tell you that the people of my riding of Sault Ste. Marie are getting just as excited. As you are well aware, Mr. Speaker, my Opposition riding is home to, to Algoma Steel. A manufacturer of high quality CITT certified steel plate. And we are thinking that you are going to need a lot of steel, steel, steel. Okay. I'm going to interrupt the member. I'm going to interrupt the member and ask the opposition to come to order so that I can hear the member who's at the other end of the chamber. I would ask the member to conclude his question. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? That is going to create a whole lot of jobs, jobs, jobs. So, Mr. Speaker, will the minister please tell us more, more, and more about all of the opportunities that this will create for all Question. of the people of Ontario? Here, here, here. Minister of Transportation, reply. Thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks for that follow-up question. As the member has stated, our province uh, is going to need plenty of skilled trade workers and materials like steel to build the subways going forward. So we can build the subways in Scarborough, the Young Extension, we can build out the Eglinton East or West, West excuse me, and of course the much needed Ontario line. Mr. Speaker, the NDP may want Algoma Steel not to be involved in the process. They may want them to shut it down, but we believe all companies throughout Canada, throughout the world, should be able to bid. We're, we, we need people like Algoma Steel and all job creators to put their pencils down, to sharpen them up, be part of the RFP process so that we can get the shovels in the ground as soon as possible. As soon as they're released, we're going to get these tenders, and we hope, we hope that all companies put our part of the process. We're not giving up on Northern Ontario. We think it's a possibility if they bid right, Mr. Speaker, if they participate Response. in the RFP process, there are job, job, jobs for Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for University, Rosedale. Thank you. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday, Toronto City Council released 61 important questions about the Premier's vague transit plan. These 61 questions cover everything from cost estimates, project life cycles, types of vehicles, ridership levels and station locations. With the lack of details we've seen on the Premier's plan, it will be years before he can provide answers to these questions. How can the minister expect Ontarians to support tearing up well-researched plans in favour of lines on a map when there are this many unanswered questions? Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much uh, for the question, Member Opposite. Uh, you know, I've, I've answered this question previously that we're going to utilize the work that has been done to date uh, in building our Ontario line, Mr. Speaker. We're going to take the spine of the relief line and extend it out from Ontario Place to the Ontario Science Centre. The Ontario line is going to be built, and it's going to be built two years ahead of schedule. We're aiming for 2027, Mr. Speaker. That's what we're doing. Now, the City Council has offered uh, a bunch of questions. It's not going to take years to answer these questions, Mr. Speaker. We're going to get to work on these questions and get back to the City Council. But I think what the member opposite is missing out here is generally the mayor is as accept, uh, supportive of our plans. The regional councillors are supportive of our plans, Mr. Speaker. 
the subway rider, the commuter, is finally saying thank you, thank you, thank you. We're finally going to get the extensions, expenses we need. I would hope the member opposite can get to work, help us move this project further. Response. Let's build subways together. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Back to the Minister. The very same City of Toronto report also confirmed the Premier's broken promise on the transit tax transfer that will cost Toronto $1.1 billion over the next decade. That means much-needed repairs to buses, subway tracks and stations will be put off indefinitely, putting the safety and sustainability of the system at risk. If you want to address overcrowding, you invest in the TTC with the transfer tax. If this government won't support transit now, why should anyone believe they will support transit in the future? Minister again. Mr. Speaker, I don't understand how the member opposite can say that we don't support transit in this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have invested $1.2 billion in the Ottawa LRT. We have committed to a $1 billion to the Hamilton LRT. We have committed to expanding the sixth laning of Highway 401 from Tilbury to Elgin County. We have committed to twinning the highway up in Kenora. Mr. Speaker, we have committed $28.5 billion to subways expansion in the city of Toronto. Mr. Speaker, I would hope the member opposite could read, look up in the dictionary and see what is the opposition to this bill. We are supportive. We are supportive to transit in the city. We are going to work with the city through the terms of reference and continue our upload. We're going to take those maintenance costs off of the city's books in order to help them uh, operate the TTC day to day, Mr. Speaker. Subways are coming to Toronto, and we're going to deliver them on time, on budget. We're looking forward to your support going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Um, Mr. Speaker, we have had an announcement from the Minister about the plan to take thousands of adults, including teachers, out of grades 4 to 12, classrooms and schools, and to remove Order. 440 hours of in-person classroom time from high school. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member for Don Valley West has every right to ask a question, just as every other member does, without constant interruptions right off the bat. You can ask the member for Niagara West to come to order, the Minister of Government and Consumer Services to come to order. <coughs> Start the clock. I apologize to the member. Please place your question. Speaker, but right now there are no details about what those cuts are actually going to mean school board by school board. Uh, right now schools can't plan for the next school year. Their staffing committees can't do their work because the minister has not yet informed boards about the size of their grants for student needs. As Minister of Education and then as Premier, Mr. Speaker, I endeavoured to get GSNs to boards by March 31st, even if that meant releasing them before the budget, so that boards could have information about what was coming. Because of the uncertainty, this this year, the surplusing that the, uh, the NDP has been talking about and is happening all over the province is happening because boards don't have those numbers. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the government made a very big fuss on Budget Day about releasing future budgets before the end of March, and if that did not happen, the millionaire premier and the millionaire finance minister would have to pony up a few thousand dollars. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. 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 The member for Northumberland will come to order. Okay. Start the clock. Minister to reply. I'm not going to make her apologize. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. She should have well, to apologize again, for that. I, I'm stunned at the question and the manner in which it was presented from the member Terrible. opposite. Disgraceful. Because the fact of the no matter humility. is, 
after 15 years of mismanagement, when she had her hand on the education wheel, yep. we saw schools Kids across the history. province crumble. Speaker, we are getting back on track. We're listening, and we're working with our education partners, and we want to work with our labour partners. We've invited them to come to the table as early as April 29th. We want to hear in good faith their ideas and their suggestions how no they might try and, and put election. some no elbow humility. grease into the situation that's broken and help us solve the issue that the Liberal government created under that member's Response. watch. The fact of the matter is we're investing. We're investing $13 billion over the next 10 years to build schools and to renew schools. And Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, every time I ask a question about education, there's a, a heckle across the floor that there were schools closed on our watch. Mr. Speaker, there were 800 schools built on our watch. Off the clock. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, will come to order. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, is warned. Start the clock. I would ask the member for Don Belly West to conclude her question. Mr. Speaker, that, the point is that the question has not been answered. This is not business as usual. The minister knows full well that if all the decisions about cuts and changes have been made, she could either release the GSNs or at least reach out to the directors of the 72 boards and tell them what is coming. The minister's lack of action on this front raises the question of what else is going on. Is the minister actually interested in creating turmoil in the system, or is the minister withholding information from the boards because she is looking for further ways to cut the education budget? Is that what is going on, Mr. Speaker? Order. The member for Windsor West has to come to order. The minister can reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I totally and absolutely re reject, I can't even spit that word out, I reject the premise that that member opposite is trying to perpetuate to because the fact of the weeks. matter is it is taking absolutely every effort we have within our ministry to get back on track after 15 years of mismanagement that that member was responsible here, here. for. So let me tell you what we're doing. We're working with our boards every day, and they know that they'll be receiving their GSN numbers by April 25th. And over and above that, they know that we're sincere when we say we are going to focus on getting back to the basics and the fundamentals to make sure student achievement is once again the number one priority for education in Ontario. And again, we're investing in education this year, over $700 million alone to start fixing the problems that that Response. member opposite created under her watch. And I can't wait to get started. Here, again, here. the GSN numbers are going to be out by April 25th. Thank you. Stop the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Great. Speaker, the most difficult time in a family, the most difficult time for a family is the loss of a loved one. It's a time when families need support most. When dealing with the death of a loved one, the last thing a family wants is to deal with a tax bill from the government. That is why I'm proud of the changes being proposed to the Estate Administration Act in the last week's budget. Can the Minister of Finance please tell the House what our government is doing to restore respect for families in their time of need? The question is to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from York Centre for that thoughtful question. Last week, we were proud to stand in this legislature and deliver our government's first budget. Budget 2019 is a plan that respects families, puts people first, and protects what matters most. And, Speaker, as part of that plan, we are proposing to eliminate the estate administration tax on the first $50,000 for all taxable estates. With our proposed changes, about 2,500 
estates would be exempt from paying tax and all other taxable estates would see an approximately 20 percent reduction in the estate tax they are required to pay. Now, Speaker, this is all about restoring compassion Response. and respect for families, putting people first during the most difficult time of their lives. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Finance for that response. I'm proud to be part of a government that stands up for families when they need it most. Mr. Speaker, the previous government imposed arbitrary timelines for families to file returns, which caused undue hardship and stress on already grieving families. They were forcing families to provide a detailed account of their assets to the government within days of passing of a loved one. It was an approach which showed no compassion whatsoever. This is a tough time for families, and they have every right to expect sympathy and understanding from their government. Can the Minister of Finance further outline how these changes speak to our government's commitment to put the people first? Minister of Finance again. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, as a government, we should be focused on reducing <laughs> the burden, not adding to the burden of families. That is why. We are extending the deadlines for filing returns from 90 days to 180 days in order to reduce the burden on grieving families. Unlike the previous government, we will give families more time to respond to the unexpected death of a loved one. In addition, our government will continue to explore options to provide even further estate administration relief, including to charitable donations. We're fundamentally changing the way government treats taxpayers and building a relationship that is founded on respect. The people of Ontario deserve nothing less. Speaker, our government is and will remain focused on putting Response. people first and ensuring they are always at the centre of every single decision we make. Here, here. The next question. The member for Waterloo. Much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, this government's first budget cuts $250 million from our provincial highways, with further cuts planned down the road. This means less money, or even no money, for projects like the twinning of Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph. This project was first announced in 2007. It is the ultimate Groundhog Day project. Unfortunately, this project was absent from this budget, and so far the government has only committed funding for repaving. Mr. Speaker, the province has already spent $120 million on this project. It just needs to get done. Can the government commit to a funding, a commitment and a completion date for the twinning of Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph? Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks, uh, member opposite, for that question. You know, I, I heard yesterday on the radio the member opposite was saying that this uh, this plan, this project, was cancelled, which is untrue, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, we're doing our due diligence in reviewing every and all project that uh, we've put forward uh, that has been in the books and ensuring that we're going to plan this out right and ensure that projects are are underway. And you know, the new Highway 7 from Kitchener to Guelph, as I said, is still under review. And our capital plans are going to be released in the next couple of months. So I uh, respectfully ask the member to. Uh, Stay tuned for uh, how we're going to proceed, but construction of Highway 7 is undergoing three new phases to be built. 80% of Phase 1 constructions are complete, with the final phase construct one, phase 1 construction project at the Victoria Street Bridge in Kitchener is going to be completed, completed later this spring. Design of two new highway bridges across the Grand River continues, which is part of the Phase 2 Response. of the project. A design and construction report of the new Grand River bridges will be made available for a 30-day public review after the design is complete and environmental field work is ongoing, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Kitchener-Waterloo has been stay, stayed tuned for 12 years yeah. now. It's, it's a long time in the coming, and it, right now it is not in any plan and it was not in any budget. And so if this government won't commit to twinning Highway 7, then they should be actively working to ease traffic between Kitchener and Guelph. Uh, if if two-way all-day go, for instance, was actually delivered, at least some people would be able to move safely between Kitchener and Guelph, saving value 
valuable time. And this project has also been proven to be an economic driver for the entire region. But both projects, both the GO and the twinning of Highway 7, are without concrete plans, set maybe to be delivered in an undetermined future date, but with no funding commitments attached. But the government has been clear that there is money on the table for Toronto transit projects, while other areas in the Question. province, like the Highway 3 project in southwestern Ontario, why can't they be clear about the funding for Kitchener-Waterloo? The member for King Vaughan come to order. Minister of Transportation will reply. Uh, thanks very, uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I don't understand why the member is trying to be divisive on this issue. I think it's something we're all working to go forward on this. Members uh, of the Kitchener region on uh, this side of the House talk to me daily about uh, uh, how we're working with Highway 7. We've increased Kitchener Go uh, by 25% over the last year, Mr. Speaker. We're working towards two-way all-day go for Kitchener. Um, look, Mr. Speaker, we're investing across the entire province. Uh, uh, in builds, and as I mentioned earlier in the previous questions, from Kenora to Ottawa, uh, all the way down to the London area, Mr. and everywhere in between, Mr. Speaker. But you know, it, it's ironic that this member opposite is standing up. Where was she for the past seven years under the, uh, uh, the Liberal government, who never delivered, never delivered? But what did this member do? She propped him up and supported him at every single budget that didn't deliver Highway 7. This government is going to deliver on our promises, Mr. Speaker. Order. <laughs> Order. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Whitby. Yeah. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday, the minister made a very exciting announcement that affects Durham Region residents. Speaker, our government for the people made a commitment during the election to get the people of Ontario moving. And in just nine months, we've made strides in doing just that. For Durham Region alone, our government has announced 15-minute midday service between Oshawa GO Station and Union Station from Monday to Friday, doubling, Speaker, midday weekday service. The opening of new park and ride lots in Durham Region increased the size of some of the trains on Lakeshore Reese GO Train from 10 to 12 cars and allowing kids 12 and under to ride free on GO Transit. Can the Minister of Transportation share the details about yesterday's announcement? The question is to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Whitby for that question and uh, such a great caucus whip keeping us in line here every day. So thanks very much for that question. Mr. Speaker, members of our government from the Durham region are unrelenting champions on improving transit opportunities for their region, and, and I'm constantly working with them day in and day out. And Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to announce yesterday that as of today, our government is adding a new Express GO train on the Lakeshore East Line. This line will offer more choice for transit users and commuters traveling from Oshawa, Whitby, Ajax, and Pickering. We are putting people first by investing in public transit to shorten commute times and get people moving faster so they can be where they need to be to be much faster and, in fact, get home after a long day outside. When we build and invest in transportation, we're getting people home, and that's, that's the key focus, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to build. We're going to continue Response. to expand on GO Transit. Mr. Speaker, it's going to be nothing but great news coming from this government with regards to transit. Supplementary. Yeah, thank you uh, to the Minister of Transportation for that great response. And I'm thrilled to hear this news, and I know the residents of Durham Region, as well as my caucus colleagues, uh, are excited about these additional trains. Speaker, Durham residents will now be able to enjoy a new weekday morning Express GO train leaving from the Oshawa GO station at 7.50 a.m., then serving Whitby, Ajax and Pickering before arriving at Union at 8.42 a.m., and a return trip will leave Union Station at 4.50 p.m., running Express Speaker to Pickering GO Station, then stopping at Ajax and Whitby stations before arriving at Oshawa GO Station at 5.43 p.m. Can the Minister of Transportation share more, share more information about this great announcement? The Minister of Transportation. Thanks again for that supplemental, Mr. Speaker. 
As the member stated, uh, we will be adding an express train in the morning and in the evening commute. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people in just nine short months has made significant announcements that benefit people entire, across the entire province. And, you know, I'd be happy to share what we've announced so far, Mr. Speaker, so the chamber, chamber can hear it and the members opposite can hear it. Uh, what has happened. We've announced the largest investment to build subways in Toronto in the GTHA, $28.5 billion. <laughs> Together, we ended the Drive Clean program. We've expanded GO service that offers commuters more, more choice uh, for commuters in Markham and Brampton, Etobicoke, Kitchener, Niagara. We've invested $1.3 billion in highway infrastructure outside of the GTHA. We're investing $1.62 billion in joint provincial and federal funding for critical public transit outside of the GTHA. We're investing $1.2 billion in Ottawa Stage 2 LRT. We're investing a billion dollars in the Hamilton LRT. Mr. Speaker, we even announced Kids Ride Response. Free on Go. Wow. Mr. Speaker, we have new station, Go Station, with by Minnickle, and we're just getting started, Mr. Speaker. The next three years are going to be so exciting for transit. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Brampton has been left behind for far too long. The past 15 years of Liberal governments has left our city having only one hospital that is chronically underfunded and overcrowded, the most expensive car insurance in this country, and at the, an 11th hour promise for a university that was cancelled by this Conservative government. People in Brampton want change. But instead of things getting better, they're going from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. There was not one word in the budget about a new hospital for Brampton. Shame. But there are drastic cuts mm -hmm. to education and transit that will hurt our city. Why is this active Government side, come to order. Brampton behind? Questions to the Deputy Premier. Thank you very much. Well, I thank the member for the question. I agree with you that the previous Liberal government uh, led things from bad to worse, yep. especially in health care, but we're fixing that. We have a plan. Bill 74, if passed, is going to make sure that we put the needs of patients first and foremost, as we uh, have in every other decision that we make. We understand that Brampton is a growing community, that there are concerns with growth. We have a capital plan for hospitals, both for new builds as well as for making sure that our existing hospitals are kept in good shape. So we have put aside uh, a, a huge amount of money, $70 billion in capital over the next number of years to make sure that we can do those builds and that we can do those maintenance and repairs that need to be done to keep hospitals across the province open for business, including in Brampton. Supplementary question. Speaker, let's look at the Conservative track record for Brampton. Since getting elected, they have already approved increases to car insurance rates. They cancelled our university and they voted against ending our health crisis in Brampton. Brampton is the ninth largest growing city in our country. It is the fastest growing city in this country. But despite this, the Conservative government does not even name Brampton even once, not even once, for any sort of investment in their budget. Wow. The people of Brampton deserve better. We deserve a budget that would have ended hallway medicine, brought in a university, and lowered car insurance rates. Instead, we got a budget that gave us nothing. My question is very clear. Why? Order. The Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Referred to the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. As can be seen in our uh, thoughtful budget, the fear mongering that came from the NDP was all for naught. The budget balances in five years while protecting what matters most health care, education, and our core public services. The health budget alone increases $1.3 billion this year, with $384 million to hospitals, or $267 million added to home care. In addition, we're investing $90 million in new low-income seniors' dental plan. I'm really looking forward to the NDP voting in favour of this budget to give those seniors that much-needed relief. 
The education budget increases by $700 million this year, and we're investing $13 billion over 10 years Response. in capital improvements, including $1.4 billion this year alone, and a $1 billion for 30,000 new daycare spots in schools. We're looking forward to supporting the state. Thank you. Next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. It is clear that our government's budget is designed to protect what matters most and puts people first. Sure right. After years of waste and mismanagement, it is great to see that we finally have a plan that will restore the people's trust in governments and put more money in people's pockets. I've heard from numerous people in my riding of Burlington that child care is unaffordable and not accessible. The good people of Burlington are thrilled that the care tax credit is going to help them accessing high quality and affordable child care. Can the minister please explain how the government is bringing relief to Ontario's parents and helping them access more options when it comes to child care? Great question. Minister of Education. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank you to the amazing member from Burlington. She She's a very proud mom and a very proud grandma. She shows that she cares every day. And I am so proud to share with you, Speaker, that our plan is proposing to help support our parents like never before. This is about giving parents, not the government, control over the child care decisions that they have to make. Our child care access and relief from expense tax credit, or CARE for short, will provide 300,000 Ontario families with funding up to 75 percent of their eligible tax care or child care expenses. Families will have the ability to choose from the child care option that is best suited for their children, including care in centres, in home care, or camps. Yep. We know that by choosing appropriate Choice. child care, it's, uh, it's absolutely the most important decision parents make. Response. And that's why we've designed care to be one of the most flexible child care initiatives ever introduced in Ontario. It's about giving parents choice and leaving more money in their pockets. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister. You're doing a phenomenal job, and the, for all the parents and all the children, thank you so much. I'm so glad that this government believes in empowering parents to make the decisions that are best for their children and their families. Time and time again, I heard that the previous government simply did not listen to the good people of Ontario. It is so refreshing to hear that finally we have a government that will support parents and put them in charge of making important decisions for their children. Could the minister please tell me more about how the CARE tax credit will bring the greatest relief to parents and families in Ontario? Minister. Absolutely. I'd be pleased to share more information on this support. Families in Ontario could receive up to $6,000 per child up to the age of seven. $3,750 up to 16, and families or parents that have children with special needs will receive $8,250. Speaker, that is per child in the family. And families who support a child uh, with going to camp or in care or in home child care have so many opportunities to offset their expenses they may occur and this will enable them to take on a new job or maybe work longer hours we were in pickering the amazing riding of pickering last friday the minister of finance and i heard firsthand from herb goldsmith that he owns he's been in the business for 40 years and herb goldsmith says this is the best thing to happen for parents in here, here. decades here, here. and we really appreciate that perspective and Response. you know what? we're going to build on existing child care expansion, expense deduction, yep. CCED, and focus benefits on low and middle um, income families. Fantastic. Mr. Fantastic. Speaker, fantastic. this will make child care more Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Recently, I met with lawyers from the South Asian Legal Clinic of Ontario, which assists residents in Beaches, East York, and elsewhere with their legal issues. They were worried that legal aid funding would be slashed, and they were right. The 30 per cent cut to Legal Aid Ontario will be devastating for women like Monica, a client who was a victim of human trafficking brought to Canada and forced into sexual slavery. The clinic helped her get permanent residence and build a better life. Can the Attorney General explain why the government is balancing the books on the backs of vulnerable women like Monica? The question is to the Attorney General. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question um, and uh, and for raising the. Uh, the difficulties that Monica has been fa facing, and it's something that our government would like to uh, to work uh, to work with her, with clinics and with uh, with other government service providers to to assist her. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the issues with legal aid have nothing to do with the, with uh, the kinds of services they are providing. As I've said in this house, they provide vital legal services uh, for the most needy in our society. The problem with legal aid is the way it is currently structured. It doesn't make sense that that a government invests, spends more and more money on legal aid services, and yet fewer and fewer people actually get those services, Mr. Speaker. Over the last five years, legal has spent $86 million more, and over 100,000 fewer people have received those Response. services. Mr. Speaker, I know that change is, can be a, a little bit dis, can be difficult, but at this time, it, the Auditor General is the, uh, has, the, has pointed out the need for his. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Cuts, cuts have deep consequences. Another client, Artie, was desperate to leave her abusive marriage and needed her parents' help to take care of her kids while she resettled. Salco helped her parents get a visitor's visa. The racism and barriers that these clients face mean that they Order. often live in fear. For them, legal aid is a lifeline. Without it, more women, especially racialized women, will be trapped in situations of poverty and gender-based violence. Can the Attorney General explain why this government continues to pay lip service to victims of gender-based violence, but has just made it harder for women like Monica and Artie to rebuild their lives? Members will please take their seats. The member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. The Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Legal aid is a vital service, and that's why it is so important that we take the time and do the work to reform it. It is not working, Mr. Speaker, as it is currently structured. The Auditor General provided 15 recommendations on ways to improve it, to make sure that those services are being provided to more and more people. Eligibility requirements were being increased year after year Opposition after year. Order. And over those five years, Mr. Speaker, 106,000 106, fewer people had access to those services, Mr. Speaker. That doesn't make any sense. It is difficult to change change such a huge agency Mr. Speaker, Waterloo, come to but order. it is essential for the people of Ontario that we do this work so I would ask the member opposite to join us in supporting legal aid as it continues down this path of reform I apologize to the Attorney General once the ovation started I could not hear her I had to cut her off in mid sentence. The member for Ottawa Centre has to come to order. The member for Niagara Centre has to come to order. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Barry Innisfil, no, Barry Springwater, Oral Medante. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Our government is aware of the absolute disdain the previous Liberal government had for Ontarians who enjoy taking advantage of our bountiful natural resources. Fifteen years of neglect led to a moose tag draw system that failed both the hunting community as well as the tourism industry in Northern Ontario. Starting today, April 17th, Ontarians can submit applications for the 2019 moose tag draw. Mr. Speaker, the minister is very vocal in supporting the things that matter most to Ontarians, and this is yet another example. Can the minister take a shot at updating us on what, how the government for the people is fixing this failed Liberal system and address the concerns expressed by the hunters? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, the member for that question, and I will also want to thank him for standing up for Ontario hunters. My family are hunters too, and I'm hoping the Premier will give me a couple of days off this fall maybe to join them. <laughs> they were ignored far too long under the previous government. Unlike the Liberals, our government for the people is listening to the valid concerns expressed by hunters. My ministry is, re is reviewing our approach to how the province manages moose, including the current tag draw system. 
We want to ensure a sustainable moose population and hunting opportunities for future generations. Throughout the review, we will engage with hunters and other stakeholders to inform them of our decisions. In, this supplement, in the supplementary, I'll be happy to expand on how our government is listening to hunters' concerns. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his answer. I have some bad news for the minister that even if the premier says he can go, he has to get through the whip. Mr. Speaker, we know hunters across Ontario will be relieved to hear they finally have a government with a minister of natural resources and forestry who's willing to listen and take their concerns seriously. The current situation is a personal one for a lot of Ontarians. They're avid hunters, and they use the moose tag system frequently. A review is long overdue. The previous government had years to fix a well-known problem in the system, and they chose to ignore it and focus on raising taxes instead. Can the minister update the House on what he hopes to achieve through this review? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member for a supplementary. As mentioned in the great budget put forward by my colleague, the Minister of Finance, fixing the current tag draw system is an important part of the overall review of how Ontario, Ontario's approach to moose management. By continuing to engage with hunters and other stakeholders, I am confident that we will be able to identify solutions and address their concerns. Hunters are some of the best stewards of our natural resources, and by working with them, we will make the system simpler and more accessible and ensure a healthy moose population. Later today, I will have more to say on our new Big Game Management Advisory Committee, or Big Mac, and the work they will do in the coming months. The work to clean up yet another, another Liberal mess is only just beginning. Thank you, Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Brampton Centre is given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Premier concerning education cuts to the Peel District School Board. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. A number of members have informed me they'd like to raise points of order. The first one is the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. I rise in a point of order this morning to draw your attention to a concerning behaviour by the member from Peterborough Kawartha, and it truly is disappointing that I actually have to bring this to the House's attention. This morning, the uh, member from Peterborough Kawartha stooped to the level of looking over the shoulder of the member for Waterloo to copy information from her question to take details of the text of the government staff uh, and took the text to the government staff before the question was even asked. This type of behaviour, Speaker, is a new low here in this legislature, and it falls beneath the standard of conduct expected by all of us here, the honourable members. Members should not have to worry about being accosted at their desks here in this House, and I ask you to do whatever is necessary to ensure that this has not become the norm in this place. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the member's point of order. Um, we'll take it under advisement, but I would certainly obviously indicate to the House that there, there has to be uh, courtesy extended from member to member, and uh, it, it, we have to uh, maintain a standard of decorum if, in here if we're going to have a civilized debate over the course of the next three years and a bit. Minister of Education. And uh, I just want to correct my record because I want to manage expectations accordingly. Given that we don't know exactly how well the MEL will work, I want to assure school boards across Ontario will receive their GSN numbers by the end of April. Thank you very much. Member for Don Valley West on a point Thank of order. Very much, Mr. Speaker. I just beg the indulgence of the House to introduce the mom of Gwen Chasson, who is one of our pages, Vanessa Silver, and her grandfather, Gwen's grandfather, Martin Chasson, who are both in the House today. Thank you. The member for Mississauga Streets, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to take a moment to welcome a civilian member of the Peel Regional Police, Mr. Jazz Singh. This house stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>